Welcome to Rates and Barrels. It's Thursday, March 7th, day four of Eno in Arizona, episode three with Eno in Arizona. And this is one we're going to finish up our team preview series. The last three teams, all from the NL East. We have the Braves, the Phillies, and the Mets on tap for today. So three very interesting teams. A lot of other housekeeping to get to real quick. We have a listener survey that is up right now. We're looking for some feedback about you and your podcast habits. The Athletic has put together a survey. It should take about 10 minutes. Theathletic.com slash survey24 is the URL. I'll put that in the show description. You can click through on that. Good news is three lucky entrants will win $100 worth of Amazon vouchers for filling out that survey. So we appreciate everybody who takes a few moments to go ahead and do that. The Discord is open. We'll put the link for that in the show notes as well. Be sure to jump in there if you haven't done so already. You know, how's it going for you on this Thursday? Looks like you did okay after roasting in the sun for an hour in Peoria on Tuesday. Oh, it's it's better now that I'm not in my Airbnb. Uh, I don't know if anybody saw my tweet, but uh, I'm on the 11th floor of a building and the elevator doesn't work. Uh which really sucked yesterday because I ran eight miles and then had to go up and down 11 flights of stairs. <laughs> Actually, it's 12 because of the mezzanine or whatever. Uh, there's a, a pervasive smell of meat in my room. I don't know why. It's not super unpleasant, but it is always there, which is like kind of gets annoying after a while. Like you're trying to go to bed and it smells like meat. Um, and uh, the Wi Fi didn't work for a couple of days. Uh, and my bed is a sofa bed. I don't know why. I'm in like basically what looks like a hotel room. It's in a high rise. It's great. It's a sofa bed. So hmm. uh, despite all those things, I am uh, well rested today, have kept up with my miles, have not eaten the very worst food. I've had a bunch of yesterday. I had eight tacos. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I am I'm tacoing my way through uh, spring training. Uh, and today I got to talk to uh, Brady Singer about his new four seam and sweeper. Nelson Velasquez about game power versus raw power uh, and MJ Melendez as well. So it was a, a good morning as well. It's weird to me that you ate eight tacos yesterday and you think the pervasive meat smell is coming from the Airbnb. <laughs> Are you sure it's not just you that you don't reek of meat? And you're I've got the meat yourself? sweats. <laughs> yes. oh, That's what no. it sounds like. Oh, no. I mean, That's... the first thing I ask my family when I pick them up Friday night, do I smell like meat? i <laughs> <laughs> love you too <laughs> my personal record for tacos in a day 15 it was oh. set in uh, 2003 so it's been a long time at spring a, training no no i wasn't at spring oh. training it was on a, a drive back <laughs> from dallas to milwaukee so you hit up all the texas Taco they weren't high quality like tacos. I mean, I was in college. Oh. They were, they were mostly like fast food grade tacos. So, oh, oh, that sort of thing. I'm gonna try and do this with good tacos someday because I feel like now I've got the means, I have the knowledge, I've matured. So, 15 will be the record that I will break at some point in the yeah, near I guess future. I do have a food recommendation then, uh, considering my taco situation. Mm. Uh, Buqui Bici. Uh, brewery is a uh, Mexican owned and run um, uh, brewery that um, had a great Schwarz beer and beautiful tacos that I really enjoyed. So that's where I was last night. That's where I'm headed next time I go to Arizona because that record is going down. Let's <laughs> get to our Braves preview. This is a loaded lineup, you know, and this is a team five of the top 20 WRC plus improvers from 2022 to 2023 were regulars in this lineup. Acuna was number one. He was plus 56. Marcelo Zuna was fourth, plus 50. Matt Olson was sixth, plus 40. Eddie Rosario was 10th, plus 38. Kind of got back to being league average to being well below league average. And Ozzy Albies, plus 30, was 18th. It seems like up and down the entire lineup, everybody who could have gone off last year pretty much did across this group. And it just leads to a pretty obvious question of like, well, what else can they do? Can they get even better? Are they a lock to regress just a little because they were so off the charts good across the board last year? Like, I, I don't have any strong case beyond just simple 
mathematical regression for saying these guys are going to decline because the way they did it across the board was really impressive. Yeah, I wonder. I I, I think, you know, uh, superstars like Ronald Acuna Jr. and Matt Olson are going to toggle around some sort of higher mean. So, yes, they could regress and still be 40% better than league average. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, and so, you know, yes, there could be some regression there, but I do think this is such a good young lineup still, peak, you know, peak of their careers lineup, that there are other guys that actually could do better. Michael Harris, the second, had a 115 WRC plus last year and improved his chase rate. I think there might be another level for him, and that could cover some regression from the top. Um, I think that you've got, uh, you know, you've got a young player that replaced Eddie Rosario. Um, and so at least the potential for better than league average play, um, exists from that spot. Um, I think Sean Murphy might have another level, you know, he, he got injured and his team, his, his season was, was kind of, you know, pretty different. Uh, if you cut it into, into halves around that injury, um, and then Ozzy Albies, uh, it was a really great season for him. Um, I, I guess I would bake in a little bit of regression for him there. I guess as a as a team, though, I would say maybe the pitching can step forward and cover some of the regression from the offense as well. Yeah, I'm thinking I'm with you though on the the areas of potential growth. I mean, Harris in particular, when he came back from his injury last year, he was hitting the ball hard. He wasn't really getting rewarded for it. That leveled out over time. It ended up being a small step forward in terms of the underlying numbers with that K rate getting a lot better, but also the hard hit rate creeping up and the ground ball rate coming down. So if you give him a full season, which he should get, given the way they handle players in this team, given the value of his defense in center field, that could nudge him up even further. The projections have him at 596 plate appearances, 281, 20 homers, 25 steals. That's from the bad X, and that's with great run and RBI production. That all makes sense to me. You're going to pay for it because he's going to go probably end of round two, beginning of round three. But I think it's justified at this point. Basically, I don't see value here because you're getting superstars that don't get days off. I guess I also wonder, is there a downside to playing your core as much as Atlanta plays its core? Will that eventually catch up to them and grind some of these guys down a little bit faster than if they were getting preventative maintenance? It seems pretty different than what, is going on in LA. Um, but LA is also an older team. Yeah. Big age difference. And so I, I wonder if load management will come into play, you know, for the Braves as they get older. I don't know why I, I think you can play these guys. Uh, the one caveat is Sean Murphy, you know, he was awesome in the first half last year. 166 WRC plus hit 306 with a 400 OBP, 599 slugging. I don't think they overplayed him. I, you know, he got a concussion, I believe, or he got hit at least. And the second half, he had a 69 WRC plus, decidedly not nice. So, you know, I think that you could see him put together a full season. They don't actually play their catcher like super, super hard. So, you know, he won't be necessarily the highest volume catcher like the rest of the Braves seem to be highest volume at their positions. Um, but I, I do I do believe he's a good pick on this team that does represent a good pick at cost, you know, where he's going. I think he's better than that. So he's one of the few that I think is, is sort of worth circling as relevant in all leagues, easily a top 10 catcher, might be a top five catcher. It's kind of going back end, you know, back end, you know, according to his projections. Uh, so I like Sean Murphy. Yeah, a little bit of value, I think, on Murphy where he is going right now. Uh, you mentioned the younger outfielder replacing Eddie Rosario. It's Jared Kelnick coming over in that trade with the Mariners. Uh, they've also made a point to say they want to see what he does against left-handed pitching. I think the the bigger question around Jared Kelnick and what happened last year was he had a great April. And from May 1st on, he was a below average player. He had an 88 WRC plus from May 1st on. Only four homers in his last 315 plate appearances. He was striking out a third of the time during that span. And then, of course, there was the water cooler incident, which led to an IL stint. It's a fresh start for him and an opportunity to not just be the guy. Like He's not the centerpiece of a blockbuster trade anymore. He's one of many players on a team that's loaded with talent. So where are your, where are your expectations going 
with Kelnick. Now he's getting a fresh start in a new organization. Yeah, one of the big things with him, I think, is they're just hoping for somebody whose error bars skew in the right direction. He still had for the season uh, a 108 WRC plus. He's still projected uh, better than Eddie Rosario, um, and so that's what they're they're hoping for is you know be better than Eddie Rosario. That's all we're asking, right? Um, and then maybe uh, catch lightning and be a lot better than Eddie Rosario and cover some of the rest we might have from other parts of the lineup. I do see some evidence, even though he's having a very poor spring, in that even in that poor you know, second half, if you look at the September, he wasn't striking out when he came, when he came back and he was playing in September, he wasn't striking out that much. It was a 25% strikeout rate in September. That lines up with what he's done in the minor leagues. Um, right now in spring training, it's a 19% strikeout rate. You also see in September, he had a 12% walk rate and he had up and down walk rates in the minors. The spring, he has a 14% walk rate. Now these are all small samples and they're not something you want to run, you know, home with and, 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 you know, trade for in dynasty and, and get all excited about Kelnick. But what I will say is that's 21 plate appearances uh, this spring, plus another 60 or so plate appearances, uh, you know, in September and July in which he's had one of his better walk weights and one of his better strikeout rates. So you're just hoping that he can put that together with the power we saw in the first half, you know, for his career, we've got 974 plate appearances and uh, he's been 15% worse than league average, uh, but with power and speed and by outs above average, average outfield defense. So, you know, I think that they, they're saying if you play to that, it didn't cost us much. You're a league average guy. There's a financial reasons that the Braves did this because they were able to spend money this year in that trade, the Marco Gonzalez money, by paying Marco Gonzalez's money this year, they're paying money this year that they don't pay next year. And they, as, as all the dust settles next year, they'll have a, a minimum player, a player on the minimum, and again, be able to spend money. So it, it's, it, it's very difficult to get something like this, like it's somebody who's under team control on league average minimum um, and not use a prospect and just use one year money, you know, not even have to, you know, take on somebody that has three years of money on them or something, you know? So I think they did well in the trade. i I don't want to say that Jared Kelnick is amazing, but I think he really fits the, what the Braves need. I think they're going to end up playing him most of the time. And um, I think there's stuff that you can point to. Uh, also, when did he kick the cooler? <laughs> I think that was July. I mean, it doesn't perfectly line up and explain why his power went away. But uh, in September, he had really good plate approach and no power. And I'm sure his pride uh, and his toe was hurting. Mm -hmm. It was both. <laughs> Definitely both. You look at the projections, 507 plate appearances right now based on the fan graphs inputs for the bad X. If he goes over that, he could be a 2020 player with a low batting average. That's possible. And then being in what could be the league's best lineup, then you get those runs and RBIs to go along with it. Goes right around pick 200. Doesn't have to get better to be useful where he's going. I think that's the exact same situation Atlanta is in. It's like, well, he's fine. If, he, if this is what he is, this works for us. Uh, and from their perspective, he's not a free agent until after the 2028 season. So he's yeah. under cost control for a long, long time. Um, so you got Kelnick out there. You know, Marcelo Zuna is a secondary contributor that really just played at a level that I didn't think he still had after what had happened in the previous two seasons. It made made sense to me going to last year that he might be released if he didn't actually bounce back, but he did bounce back at the plate. Uh, he goes in the pick 150 range. I mean, steady power, I'm a decent about average. Him. Honestly, you know, it's a, it's a strange profile just because it's been up and down over his co whole career. Yeah, uh, he's had the raw the raw power every year, but in certain years he's injured and can't get to that raw power. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, in those years, I don't know what it is because it's not obvious. It's not like, oh, his ground ball rate is super high or this or that. It's just there are these years where he's injured and he doesn't turn his raw power into game power. And you just see like. You see a 16.6% barrel rate from Marcelo Zuna, and you say, oh, well, he really deserved all 40 of those homers. You know, that's that's really good barrel rate. Well, you would regress barrel rate as if you as you would any other stat. And so he has a 10.5% barrel rate for his career. Uh, you know, in the last three years, it's maybe a little bit higher than that. So you would probably predict he has like a 12% barrel rate or a 13% barrel rate. That's the same barrel rate that created 
23 homers in 2022. So this is a guy who could easily just hit 25 homers this coming season. Yeah, it's been uh, up and down production, but Atlanta got a lot more out of Azuna than anybody would have expected a year ago. The other player that's kind of interesting in this group is Orlando Arcia, because we were talking about the infield situation last year, and we said, well, what what are they going to do? Are they going to turn Von Grissom into a shortstop? Grissom's gone, of course, now. He's in Boston. Arcia ended up sticking around and putting together a solid year. He's another one of those guys where expectations are pretty low, and they don't necessarily have anybody really pushing to take his job. I mean, I think what he did last season was he showed that the power he started to unlock in 2022 on a per game basis was real like earlier in his career. This is a guy that usually ran barrel rates in the 5% range or lower. He's been up in that 7% range now for two seasons. So he's not the same player. He was as a prospect years ago with the Brewers, but he's turned into a pretty solid regular for this Atlanta team. Yeah. The, the thing about Orlando is here for me is just, I don't know how much I trust the power. And if I don't, I mean, it, there's, it's a nice home park for power. And it, it, it's not like you're asking him to hit 30. You're just asking him to hit like 15. But he's also, that's that's not a big number. So it's not going to give you power. It's not going to give you steel. Like he's very, very clearly like a deep league guy for me. I just, I, like I'm not sure that's something you want at middle infield in a 12 teamer. Even in a 15 teamer, I have never reached for Orlando Garcia to be like, oh, yeah, he's going to do X, Y, or Z for me. He's clearly like draft and hold or NL only for me. Yeah, I think that's the right usage. I mean, even last year, everything seemed to go right. 17 homers, 65 RBIs, 66 runs. That sort of caps out really, really deep leagues. Maybe more of a, a weekly streamer if you have some injury problems in a typical mixed league. But generally, those deeper formats are the Kudos way to Kudos to them go. for finding a league average guy. I mean, he projects to be around league average again. Um, but, you know, uh, and, and he's with them until 2026. So... They just might be like, hey, we're so stacked everywhere as a team. Yeah, we got this league average guy at shortstop. It's fine. Yeah. Well, they're finding a way to get it done top to bottom with this lineup and really not Other much teams in terms are like, of, who's our shortstop? What are we doing <laughs> at shortstop? <laughs> well, if, if everything else is figured out as well as it's figured out, you can make that kind of the revolving door sort of spot and, and live to tell the tale, as we've learned from the Braves in recent years. Let's talk about the pitching. It's still loaded. Spencer Strider, the consensus first pitcher off what a board. Badass. Look at that picture. Just incredible, <laughs> incredible projections. 34.3% projected K rate. Stuff number in the 130s. Absolutely filthy. Hazel loves Spencer Strider, too. This is a loaded rotation, though, because they added Chris Sale. And Chris Sale, as we talked about just a few days ago, is actually healthy right now. Yeah. Adding, you know, Spencer Strider is adding a curveball and throwing the change this spring. Chris Hale added an inch of ride and uh, velo. Uh, I don't know that I can list a, a great update for Max Freed, but um, Reynaldo Lopez, I watched some of his start. He actually kind of won me over as a, as a possible starter. And then AJ Smith Shaver is shoving. <laughs> I mean, he's really looking good. He's got a 123 stuff plus on his fastball this spring. Uh, it's up uh, a tick and a half in velo and a tick and ride. Um, and he just looks a lot better this spring. I was a little surprised. I look back even at the revised stuff plus numbers to find that he had an 89 stuff plus on a pitch that had good ride last year. So I'm a, I don't really understand um, why stuff plus didn't love him last year. But uh, that's basically the core of the 4.82 uh, ERA projection for him. I'd say you can ignore that to some extent. If you like him, go for him. I don't know that you have to push him so hard as to say he's as good as a Bobby Miller or any of those guys um, because there is still some question about the whole thing. Uh, but if you are looking for something late and you just want to take a shot and you know you can drop him if he doesn't make the, the, the roster, I think A.J. smith Robert is a, a fine last pitcher for, for most teams. Yeah, it's amazing how late the back-end options go for Atlanta, given how good the team is and given that you're talking about a, at least a fifth spot that's open. You know, if it's Lopez to begin the season and smith Shaver is either at AAA or in the bullpen, he could emerge if anyone gets hurt. And with this and, collection of starters, you sort of expect to have to go six yeah. or seven deep pretty easily. And, they, and, they at and least how long is covered. How many innings does Lopez have for the year? Right. Right. How is he going yeah, to do so, it? We talked about him when we were talking about the relievers 
in the would you rather earlier this week like which of these converted relievers do we think could make it as a starter and be the most valuable this year Ronaldo Lopez has gone up into the 180s twice as a starter I don't right. know how you get back into that after yeah, you I don't spend. know if you like I think you may have to ease back into that I'm not like like oh yeah, yeah. 180 again yeah, because you have a four-year stretch where it's been 50s and 60s, and then 2020 was part of that as well. So that makes it even more complicated. Or it's like how, even if you think he holds up physically, how good are the innings later in the year? Maybe you get yeah, good stuff fatigue, in the first half, and he just starts to wear down. Yeah. So I think that's one of the concerns. But they're well covered because behind A.J. smith Shaver, you still have Hurston Waldrip, who cruised through several levels last year in this system. He's probably in that number seven seat right now. I think the bigger questions about like what do you do is sale. We talked about the rising price earlier in the week. He's going closer to pick 100 now. Freed's been a guy that I think you've generally shied away from at price. Has anything changed for you with Freed over the course of the spring? You know, it is interesting to talk to Trevor May and talk about, you know, how his fastball has different shapes to different sides of the plate. It's it's interesting to talk to you and you bring up how he's one of seven pitchers with a sub three ERA over the last three years. Um, and so, you know, I like also that he's healthy and pitching again in the spring. Um, so I, 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 at some point the model matters less than on field results and definitely Max Fried is past that. So <clears throat> I just do know also that the flexor strain forearm problems are precursors to Tommy John. And so if you're taking him, you're just taking an innings risk. Yeah, there's definitely a legit innings risk, but those <clears> skills, <throat> the, the ratio skills, that is, seem to be really like legit for Max Fried. It's a question of whether or not he strikes guys out at a clip similar to the guys above him or if he stays kind of in that that second tier, kind of like that Logan Webb sort of range where it's got to be a lot of innings to offset the lower rate ratios are outstanding win probability also outstanding um, so i'm more in on free i think than you are even at that price but i think you're right to point out the injury risk and then you've got the old old veteran charlie morton still there so going after pick 200 still ticking still ticking i've mentioned that there have been some some downside some recent downsides with the the ratios the 434 era in 2022 you can kind of look at that and convince yourself that, that was a little bit of an outlier the 143 whip last year the worst of Morton's career since 2012. So more than a decade since he's been that bad in that category. That, of course, came with an 11.6% walk rate. What do you make of the walk rate going that far in the wrong direction in the age 39 season of Charlie Morton? I mean, it's just, it's really the degradation of his fastball that's the key of everything. As his fastball degrades, so he has to go to you know, things like the sinker um, and uh, the changeup. He threw the changeup more than he had in years and years and years last year. Um, and, uh, you know, those aren't pitches that he's going to command the same way. Uh, he also had to throw the curveball a ton. He was up to the, the career high in curveball usage of 43%. No matter how well you command the curveball, I don't, and I don't think he is actually as Wayne Wrightian in that regard as as you know the namesake there, because uh, Wayne Wright had more of a vertical curveball that I think he could just drop in on a vertical plane. Charlie Morton's got a two plane curveball, you know, so that's something that's taking it out of the the zone, um, you know, side to side, and he really likes to back foot it to lefties, and like you know, I, I just feel like that's a hit or miss proposition. We're just seeing the. We're just, just seeing the the end. I'm, I'm, it's so sad to say. Like, I love Charlie Morton. <laughs> I, I think it's okay to like Charlie Morton and just acknowledge that he's 40. It's just harder to yeah. get hitters out when you're 40 years old. Um, I've been staying away, even though the cost isn't really a problem. I understand the cases for wanting to have money in your roster, but I keep finding other pitchers I like in that range that I feel better about for the upcoming season. Is there anything in the bullpen that worries you as far as Rysel Iglesias just being the guy from start to finish? Because I think he's actually pretty safe. I like him as a three-pitch closer that continues to have some buffer if he loses velocity. We disagree. I love it. <laughs> it's rare. We lo we, I love it. It's good. It's good when we disagree. Uh, I, I I see a uh, velocity went from 96.3 last year in Cincinnati, 96.4 in LA, or Anaheim, sorry, uh, 95. Uh, to 95-1 last year, 
that's getting pretty close to below average velocity for a closer. He has the worst stuff plus of any established first chair closer. And uh, you see a weakening in the strikeout rate. The strikeout rate went from 37.7 in 2021 to 29.4 last year. These are, if you just look at those at the 29.4 and the 95.1 and the 2.75 ERA, you can tell yourself that he looks fine still. But I see a trend here. And then just on top of that, I love AJ Minter. You know, and I think AJ Minter can be a closer at any at the drop of a dime. And his, you know, projected strikeout rate, his stuff plus, his projected ERA are all better. Um, and so it's a loaded bullpen, I think, with options, and Iglesias could fall off. Um, they may just keep him there as the veteran in the sort of Kenley Jansen style where they're you know, there may be better guys around him, but like you keep the veteran in there, he keeps things steady, and AJ Minter blows away the four, five, six guys in the eighth inning. Um, and you win the game partially more because of AJ Minter than Rysel Iglesias. Uh, that could be the plan. It seems to be some of the plan of the past. It's just not one that I need to sign up for. Uh, and, and also, what I have been finding is I get a circle of trust closer. I don't think he's in the circle of trust. And then I don't really care who my second closer is. I will wait a long time on the second closer. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay waiting a little for that second closer. But I do think Iglesias is in the circle of trust. We finally found players we disagreed about. Like took, there we go. took five years, but we've done it. I'm with you though on the quality of the bullpen. I'll be right in him. three years. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I, I think 2024. I'm not as concerned. 2025, 2026. Yeah, like we're we're in that decline phase for Iglesias, but I think it's going to be a relatively graceful decline because of the depth of the pitch mix. I'm with the unminter. Yeah. And as Aaron Bummer was a nice pickup, Pierce Johnson's good. They got the Ken Giles reclamation project. They still got Tyler Matzik. This is a very, very good bullpen. Added Ray Kerr. So they have plenty of lefties that they do want to throw Minter into save situations at some point this season. The question we ask at the end of every team preview, the win total, this is from Pakoda, baseball prospectus, 100.6 wins for the 2024 Braves. Too hot, too cold, or just right? Too cold. I think some of their young arms are going to be ready to contribute and uh, take over for some of the older arms. Mm. And that'll paper over some of their offensive regression. Plus, seems like a team that can add to the deadline. Yeah, they always seem like they're going to be active. And even if it's just getting better on the margins, that makes a difference. Certainly, certainly a really well-built team. I think that's just slightly too hot. I think they're going to win the division. I just think it's going to be a little bit closer than the projections would lead us to believe. They're still really good, and I'm not expecting some kind of massive fall or uh, you know, a decline that comes out of nowhere for this group that are still one of the very best teams in the league despite the disappointing exit from the postseason a year ago. Let's move on to the Phillies. This is another depth chart where you look at the core hitters they rely on, you know, and it is a group that will play a ton top to bottom, right? We saw Trey Turner and it looked like himself in the second half of last year. So maybe he's a little more comfortable now with the big contract, the move to Philly. We saw Bryce Harper get it back coming off the surgery throughout the second half and really looks like he belongs at first base, looks really comfortable there. I think he could have a just a huge, huge year. He's still carrying kind of a near first round ADP. You got Real Muto, Schwarber, Castellanos, Bryson Stott, Alec Bohm. It's like a seven-player core of clear, everyday guys that project for very high volumes of playing time. Yeah, and I am in on a fair amount of them. Um, I think that Bryce Harper is a borderline first-rounder. Um, you know, there's, there's, you know, the bad X projections back me up on him being sort of a top 15 uh, bat. And I think the power is there. The comfort's there. The health is there. Uh, Trey Turner, I think, is going to bounce back. I'm not even sure that the projections capture as much of the positivity as I have about him. Um, I just think that he can steal more bases than he has. He did not really see a big uptick. Uh, with the rule changes, and I, I think he can be more aggressive uh, there than he has been. Um, and, um, well, I like Real Muto still. 
you know, he projects to be a top two catcher and people, I don't know, for whatever reason, aren't necessarily reaching for him uh, in two catcher leagues and to get what 10, 15 stolen bases, even from your catcher with a good batting average, I think is just something that they, people, you might look at it and be like, why am I, you know, drafting a 250 guy or 260 guy who's going to hit me, you know, 20 homers and steal me 10 bases he, at this point in the draft when, you know, the outfielders do, will do better. It's because of relative strength. You know, there's no other catcher who's going to do that. And that unique kind of a, of a build, you know, of a, of a package of skills, I think really helps certain builds in particular. Like if you went your Don plus uh, Juan Soto or, you know what I mean? Like if you, if you went with two sluggers at the beginning that didn't steal a lot of bases, he's a sneaky way to like add 10 bases where nobody else is getting you know, stolen bases. Where nobody else is getting it. So that's my case for the three guys. I like the most on the squad. Uh, my case for the guy I like the least on the squad offensively is Nick Castellanos, uh, 32 years old. Uh, you know, I don't, we haven't seen better than like last year was a bounce back with the 109 WRC plus, but he had two seasons uh, in the, in the three before that, where he was below average with the bat. He's a guy who really chases the pitches outside the zone. And what we saw last year, despite him having a bounce back season, is that it was the first year or the second year that his uh, contact on pitches outside the zone went below 50 percent. That's why people is not you're not great to chase. You get into your 30s and your ability to make contact on pitches outside the zone plummets. And so I'd expect the strikeout rate to continue to rise. I could see a 30% strikeout rate from him this season. By the way, that's what he has in spring. I'm not saying that that's necessarily meaningful, but I could see a 30% strikeout rate this season. All the projections say 25%. I think they're undervaluing that part of the aging curve. None of the projections really have him much better than league average uh, anyway. So if there's risk there, that he strikes out 30% of the time, hits 240, hits 20 homers, and steals you five bags. I don't think that's what people are paying for right now. No, I don't think so either. Yeah, maybe this is turning into an Eugenio Suarez sort of profile. And you think about where Castellanos goes versus where someone like Suarez goes. There's like a hundred plus picks difference in that profile. So playing time still stable because of the contract. It just seems like the skills are eroding. I think it's a really good way to call it out. And if, if the K rate is worse than it was last year, the average projections in the high 250s, low 260s are going to end up being a little too optimistic, I think for Castellanos as well. Uh, Bryson Stott, kind of an interesting player for me because I would look at that stolen base projection similar to the way you looked at Trey Turner's and say, well, 23 seems pretty light for a guy that went 31 for 34 last year. Like he could basically be the same guy again. And look, why would he be less effective as a base dealer? I think the bigger questions for me with Bryson Stott still come back to the power output. He fits into that profile of middle infielder who's speed and hit tool I trust whose power I don't and I think those players can be a little bit funky coming off of a career best year sometimes you have to overpay for skills that are kind of just okay instead of great yeah I'm having very much technical difficulties but I'm back in I'm back here uh, Alec Baum is you know an interesting player because he I think he'll hit for average uh, his, his bad ball stats aren't amazing though and, you know, Baum and Stott both came through this Phillies player development thing. And I think that they they did good and they, they produced major leaguers. Uh, I just can't help but wonder if there's not, not more power uh, with both of these guys. Kevin Long, the, the hitting coach there, is kind of a proponent of, you know, staying in your legs and line drive swing and... I can see that helping with contact rates and helping with batting averages and OBP. Uh, but I, I can't help wonder if there's some other parallel universe where Alec Baum and Bryson Stott both hit 25 homers. Um, maybe I'm wrong. I don't think in this universe they will. And so they become guys that you can fit in certain places uh, that make sense with certain builds, but they're not guys. I don't think you buy Stott and say, what if it all comes together and he hits 25 homers and he goes 20-20 this year? You buy him because he's going to give you some steals, a pretty good batting average, and you 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 load it up on power somewhere else. And right. Baum is a similar case where it's like you kind of just need a corner infielder that won't hurt you in batting average, and you've you've got power somewhere else. 
Yeah, Stott might be another Edmund from a rotisserie perspective, even though from a physical stature standpoint, I would agree. It looks like he should be able to get to more power. We did see Baum get to a little bit more power. The ongoing concern I have with him is that he doesn't handle right-handed pitching very well. I think that's the limiting factor for him. He does a lot of his damage against lefties, been kind of below average against righties really for his whole career. Unless that changes, I think we're at that what you see is what you get sort of point with Alec Bohm's production. We talked about Whit Merrifield when he signed. I think he's just sort of an extra glue guy in this lineup. I think the 470 plate appearances is probably about right. And so much of what made him valuable in the past was being a max volume player. I think he's a little bit more of a streamer for mixed leagues now than he used what to be. If he, what if he starts the season as an everyday player? I don't think he's going to play every day all the way through the season. But with Brandon Marsh hurt, you know, is there a, a situation where, you know, you want Kyle Schwarber at, at DH and um, maybe even with Marsh coming back, mm, is there a soft spot in that row house, you know, in center field? Could could Whit Merrifield take that spot? I don't know. I don't think so. Um, I think it'll be partial playing time. But if you're desperate for speed, he's an interesting guy. If he drops all the way to the end of your thing and you just pick him up and then you know, look somewhere else if it doesn't work out, I guess. Yeah, I think the Marsh injury makes Merrifield more temporarily rosterable than he would have been if Marsh were healthy and it was a clear like depth signing for when something goes wrong later, if that makes sense. Rojas is pretty intriguing. The glove alone could just keep him out there for a lot of playing time because they have so many other guys in this lineup that can hit consistently. So even if he hits a bumpy patch, I can see Rojas coming in pretty high in terms of the plate appearances for the season. Uh, much like Atlanta, not necessarily like young guys knocking on the door for time either. I think that's kind of the interesting thing about projecting roles for this Phillies team. Let's slide over to the pitching. Things are pretty tight at the top, of course. They extended Zach Wheeler. We talked about that a bit earlier in the week. They re-upped with Aaron Nola during the offseason. So their 1-2 is very good, even if we're not necessarily excited about Nola at his ADP, he's a good real-life pitcher and a formidable option behind Wheeler for those purposes. My question for you is, who else, if anyone, do you like in their cast of starters? That group includes Christopher Sanchez, Ranger Suarez, Taiwan Walker. They added Spencer Turnbull. Matt Strom popped into this rotation for stretches last year. Like, Do you see some value beyond pick 200 with some of the other options behind Wheeler and Nola? Christopher Sanchez was one of the biggest risers when we updated Stuff Plus to include platoon splits. It loves his changeup now, says it's one of the best in the game. I am really intrigued by him. I do believe there's some chatter about you know the added ticks that he's had this spring, flattening out his sinker and changeup and making them worse. I am not so worried about it, A, because we don't know if those are necessarily going to port over to when he goes to five innings. And then B, even with the added velo, if there is less movement, there is less time for the batter to react. So um, I doubt that added velo is going to make him worse. I, I, I'm still on the Christopher Sanchez hype train, uh, and I think he's a really fun late-inning guy. Ranger Suarez could be an interesting NL only um, or draft and hold player. I do believe he'll pitch. He wins some games. He's a credible starting pitcher and he has a bunch of different pitches. And if the command pops, you know, he could give you like a four, one ERA with 11 wins and be a valuable starting pitcher. I just don't think he's somebody you need to get in 10 or 12 teams. It's a little bit more of a volume and uh, hope for wins kind of a, a situation there. Yeah, just a guy, like useful at times, but not necessarily someone you want to throw out there on a regular basis in, in more shallow formats. Uh, Taiwan Walker's been slowed by a knee injury a little bit this spring. I've been wondering if they get some kind of bounce back campaign out of him. I realize the the park factor's different. Like leaving the Mets, going to the Phillies, his first year with the Phillies was disappointing for a lot of people the era jumped by nearly a run the whip at 131 was the worst it's been uh, since his last healthy season with the diamondbacks like long ago like 2017 so i'm really interested to see like with health what he might be able to do as a possible bounce back it will cost you almost nothing to find out even in like a 15 team mixed league could be one of your last bench pitchers if you like what you see great if you don't he's an easy early week cut yeah, um, the <clears throat> the bullpen is is an interesting one because Jose Alvarado 
looks like he has the skills of a closer. He's projected to have a 30% strikeout rate, 107 stuff plus, 335 projected ERA. He obviously has the stuff from a just a, a lowercase s, s standpoint. When you're watching him, you think this is a guy who could be a closer. He also, though, struggles with command and has bad years when the command is bad. So he's a little up and down, up again and down again. And they have a fair amount of that in this bullpen. He profiles really close to Gregory Soto, you know. Um, and there's other pitchers in this bullpen that have that same up again, down again feeling. And then you have this from minding the news from Jeff Zimmerman is a great little thing here um, is uh, the Phillies say it's going to be a closer commit by committee. Rob Thompson says that Jose Alvarado, Jeff Tom, Jeff Hoffman, Gregory Soto, Sir Anthony Dominguez, Strom and Kirkering will all like are all going to be in the mix. You know, and they're all like kind of have different skills. And then you have to remember, this is the same team that had Jose Alvarado and a lot of these guys on it before and went and got Craig Kimbrell to be this kind of, you know, like veteran, like the, the kind of what I was talking about with Jansen and stuff. It was like just the veteran closer who there are other better relievers on the team, but that's our closer, you know. Um, so uh, I think this is a total wild card and I'm treating Jose Alvarado as – I'm not necessarily treating him as like not having the job, but having way more question marks about whether or not he has the job than I see other people thinking when they pick him in drafts. Yeah, I like the skills a lot. I mean, we have seen a multi-year improvement with the walk rate from him. Last year, Alvarado led all closers in K-minus BB percentage at 26.7%. So they have the guy that could be the next Kimbrel for them if they choose to do that. How you choose to use your bullpen is uh, completely up to the manager in the front office, right? So if they're telling us it's a committee, we have to decide if it's a committee where one guy gets half or two thirds of the chances and <laughs> the others involved all pick all up sorts the scraps. of committees. <laughs> because 20 all to 25, sorts of different kinds of committees, yeah. If it's 20 to 25 with the skills that Alvarado has, he's being underdrafted. Then it's a good pick, yeah. <laughs> it, it picked 200. So I think it's, it's a risky spot, but I think given the guys that go in that range, <clears throat> if you're chasing that second closer, I think you could do a lot worse. And it's true. He's in a class of pitchers. This is why I wait on second closers that I just sort of collect a bucket of guys. And, you know, there's usually one that lasts longer than all the rest. And I take them. Sometimes it's Robert Suarez. I like Robert Suarez. So, you know, I, I think that it's worth it. I think there's a lot of risk once you get past the first sort of six, seven closers. And I, I just want to wait as long as possible for the second one. <laughs> I think the funny thing about being in multiple leagues is you, you take a few chances in the same bullpen. Like you say, oh, okay, over here I got Orion Kirkering really cheap in case he's the guy. In this other league, I took Alvarado. Or in this other league, I threw a, a dart at Jeff Hoffman. Like there's nothing mm -hmm. wrong with that. Like if there's a if there's uncertainty, you know, place multiple bets. Try and try and find try and find which one it is. And I am you freezing. <laughs> yeah, it looks it looks cold. I'm there. Freezing. <laughs> Today was the day I decided not to bring my hoodie. Well done. <laughs> yeah, and you sat in the shade, so you did some of it Whee! right. <laughs> 84.1 wins is the total projected by Pakoda for the Phillies. Too hot, too cold, God, or just seems right? too cold, dude. What the hell? I mean, I know you're cold, but yes, I, I why agree do with the, you. Why do, the, why do the projections not like the Phillies? I don't know. I felt like the projections maybe liked the Marlins a little more than I expected them to, and they Maybe they're a little hotter on the Mets than I would have expected to. We'll get to that here in just a minute. But I think that's part of where my my issue with Atlanta getting 106 wins comes from. So I'm looking at Philly and I'm like, 84.1 seems low. I think mm, they get a little closer to Atlanta. Tougher division than, than the projections up. think. I think. I think so. I think it's actually mm. a pretty good division still, even with the Mets sort of taking a small step back for this season. Speaking of the Mets, let's get to our Mets preview now. I think this group of hitters is actually an underrated group. You still have Lindor. You still have Pete Alonso. Francisco Alvarez, at least on the surface, looks like a low average, big power mashing catcher. I think there's one more level he's going to find as a hitter. Nimmo and Marte are healthy for now in the outfield. Jeff McNeil's okay. And then you've got a couple of young guys like Brett Beatty, Mark Vientos, who with playing time could actually exceed expectations. We know the park's a difficult place to hit, but I look at this lineup and think I've seen a lot worse going through this team preview series. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I I I enjoy shopping in this bin. <laughs> uh, Brandon Nimmo is uh, super super boring, 
and drops, I think, too far. If you can not depend on, you know, 25 homers from him and 20 homers is enough for whatever you're looking for, um, I do think he's like kind of a solid guy who will give you league average stats uh, across the board. And a lot of times that's good. You're just, you know, you're just forwarding it on. And, you know, I'm not going to go below league average yet, you know. So not something you necessarily need to reach for, but definitely something that uh, works if it falls. And uh, Jeff McNeil has been interesting to me because I've been looking for guys who can help my batting average late. And, you know, he's definitely available super late in drafts. Starling Marte is a guy that I've picked up in a bunch of places for, you know, 25 steals. I think that he's going to give that this year. Um, and I know that you'll have to, you know, get him through some ye- some time on the on the IL, and you know that's possibly likely. Maybe he gets traded into non full time playing situation. Uh, but I also don't think his contract is something that people are itching to trade for. Um, and so I think he might just stay on the Mets through the season, no matter what happens with their season. And you'll still get that twenty five steals from him. I I, I think he's a, a he's an underrated guy. Um, wrote this week about Pete Alonso's chase rate and how he's trying to cut it. Uh, maybe there's a maybe there's another level there for the batting average at least. I even like Lindor. Uh, I've got a couple places where I've got Lindor because, you know, I, I think maybe the 21 stolen bases is a little bit light. I think you could uh, end up with something with uh, 25 stolen bases from him. 260, 25, 25. Uh, yes, I want that. So there's a lot of stuff I love. Mark Vientos actually ended up in my secret sauce as mm. uh, as a possible like as a possible breakout guy, uh, super late. So I know people were wanted me to to give some NL names and I forgot to. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Mark Vientos is on that list of someone who hits the ball super hard and does some things really right, and I think has opportunity this year. I think the key for that is just Vogelback's not there anymore, so you don't have. A veteran DH, you have an opportunity for a young guy that doesn't necessarily have a position in Vientos to just take that job and run with it. And since they are taking that small step back, kind of being more like a play the middle team right now, opportunity will be there for young guys like that. It's a matter of keeping the you know, keeping the K rate down and doing damage, which he's capable of doing. He could be a twenty-five to thirty home run guy if it all clicks. Uh, We've talked about Harrison Bader a few times. I still think as a a bench outfielder in a 15-team mixed league, you could actually do worse. There's still a good bit of power and speed projected there. That's with a relatively small share of playing time. I think his glove can be really important to this team. So there's a health component there. There's a skills have never all really aligned at the same time component there. We've talked about that on a few different occasions. But I think Bader is still kind of useful to me too. So it's weird. Maybe it's because I'm not a Mets fan. I have no rooting interest in this team whatsoever. But I see a little bit more to be optimistic about than the average Mets fan does, for sure. I'm uh, looking at the the you know, Nimmo Bader projection. Also is is interesting from this type of perspective. Um, I just wrote a piece that's going to come out tomorrow about uh, what happens in walk years, and one of the things that happens in walk years is more playing time. Now, Harrison Bader was in a walk year last year and didn't have a ton of playing time, so you, it's not just a magic solve that like everybody who's in in uh, a walk year all of a sudden puts together 600 plate appearances. But he's super motivated. This is a one year deal like this is uh, you know a lifeline and a pillow and a bounce back opportunity, and uh, you know this is he's going to try as much as he can to be on the on the field this year i think the mets mostly stick him out there if he's healthy because he's their best center fielder yeah and career high in plate appearances i've said before 427 plate appearances back in 2018 so the projection kind of steers right into that he could exceed it's 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 in the realm of possibility because of what he brings to this team that nimmo projection if you run it through the auction calculator by the way makes him a top 30 outfielder He's not drafted like a top 30 outfielder because it's a lot of average. It's power without a lot of speed. It's a lot of runs. It's just the the combination of skills that our eyes often will overlook. Well, today has been fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, we're fighting all sorts of things that you'll probably all hear of the elements on the final was. track, despite the best efforts of myself and, and Brian Smith to, to clean it Apologies up. Apologies if it's... It's hard to listen to of this bad volume. This is a uh, this. I didn't expect it to go this way. There was nobody here when I started, and then all sorts of noises. <laughs> yeah, we've had the the grounds crew make a a five plus minute appearance. We've had birds. 
Uh, we've had the PA system, a little bit of everything so far today. It's what you get. You record outside at spring training. You know, you're going to have some some variables. Let's get to the pitchers before uh, everybody starts showing up for this game and makes it even <laughs> more chaotic. Uh, Kodai Singa with the shoulder injury has fallen to the kind of pick 200 range. So that's the sort of discount you're getting if you're going that route. This is a group of pitchers who deal with a very pitcher-friendly home park that actually have some pretty interesting skills and opportunity wide open, right? We talked about Luis Severino as someone that was tipping pitches last year. I love his chances of bouncing back for this Mets team, and the price is still very reasonable. Yeah, I think Luis Severino is – I've got him in a couple places. I think, it, you know, it's worth – betting on those skills and that ballpark at this point in his career. He also got the kind of deal where he wants to, you know, get back out there. Uh, he's motivated to do, to do well. I think that they're actually an underrated pitching development team too, because of some of the hirings they've done. They've got one of the best biomechanists in the league in a uh, Ben Hansen on their team uh, and a bunch of other pitching coaches up and down their development system. So uh, I think that uh, they're underrated in that regard. Uh, Shamanaya added the sweeper last year, and I think you know there's a chance with the sweeper and, and then the cutter this offseason that he finally finds some secondaries that fit what is a really good fastball. Um, Jose Quintana, I think, is a good streamer all year. I will say that Tyler McGill's fastball seems to be a dead zone fastball, and that's why his his production has gone oscillated so much up and down. It's because when he's throwing 96, he looks amazing. When he's throwing 94 and a half, it just all falls apart. I know he's throwing the American spork, as he calls it, uh, this new split finger this spring. I'm not sure if it's a solve that fixes everything. Uh, so he's not actually one of my favorite pitching sleepers, but uh, there is opportunity for there for him. Um, and he's just battling Adrian Hauser, who I think is just a kind of a power sinker guy uh, who has lived in between the bullpen and the rotation for a while now. And I don't think that he's necessarily going to take that uh, fifth starter spot either. Uh, McGill is having a great spring, by the way. Uh, real sharp so far. 13 Ks against two walks, one run allowed over eight innings. Maybe he's just finally healthy again. I and mean, that's been part of the story with Tyler McGill. The Velo is good, but we saw the Velo drop off precipitously last year. And he had he started well and it, and it really fell off. So I'm just a little bit skeptical. The other thing about Manaya that I think is worth pointing out, too, is just the way the Giants used him is probably not the way the Mets will use him. I think you'll get something that looks more like a regular starter's usage because of need on this team, and that makes him a little bit more appealing to me. I think there's a better chance of getting some wins working higher volumes of innings the way the Mets will likely have him go. My other question for you with this group, there are some prospects coming. Christian Scott gets a lot of buzz. I think Mike Vassell is another interesting name. Is there anybody you like who hasn't broken through yet to take over a rotation spot for the Mets? Yes, I believe I have some good numbers here for Vassell. Let me see what I've got. Um, yes, Vassell has a really good uh, pair of breaking balls. He's a little bit more sinker than four seams, so... Um, you kind of need to have an opinion on his changeup, but if you like his changeup, then he probably uh, can make it. He'll be a guy that it does better against righties and lefties, but maybe survives against lefties. He's got a lot of pitches that he throws, um, and so I think uh, uh, he's definitely somebody I've circled. If 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 their player development is good, then he's the kind of guy that should pop. Also in the bullpen, Edwin Diaz. It was a knee injury. He seems fine. He's pitching. He's pitching well behind the scenes. Uh, I think Edwin Diaz is probably the number one closer in baseball this year. Yeah, I'm drafting him as the first closer off the board. If I'm taking an early closer, no concerns for me, given the nature of the injury. Looks like he's the same guy he was before he went down with that. So uh, tons to like, of course, in that bullpen as they lean heavily on him to close out games. They're going to be good enough to give him plenty of save chances, too. That's the thing. Like The Mets taking a step back, they're not a rebuilding team. They're a retooling team. I think there's kind of a big difference in terms of what you expect, the kinds of games they're going to be playing on a regular basis. I would, uh, I would generally take some chances on their bats. Beatty, uh, uh, what's the catcher? Uh, Alvarez, Alvarez and yeah. Vientos. I just think, like, I think that the idea is that they're just going to get all the playing time they want this year. And we saw with Alvarez, he's changing his approach a little bit, high in the zone. Um, I think he you know, could push inch that batting average forward. Vientos could be another low batting average, but high power slugger. 
uh, that may end up taking over for Alonzo if they don't have good negotiations. You know, like mm-hmm. first base may be open next year. And then Brett Beatty is totally different than those other two guys. Makes a lot of contact, hits too much on the ground, but like he's going to get all the chances he can. And if you can just inch that launch angle up just a little bit, a little bit, he could actually be one of these Tampa Bay Rays type players where he hits the ball really hard, has a really good batting average and gets you you know, 15, 18 homers some years, 22, 25 homers other years, you know? That's totally like, you know, we said a lot of the same things about Yandy Diaz. Well, he hits the ball hard, but will he ever lift it? Well, crap, Beatty, find your inner Yandy Diaz. <laughs> I don't know if you have the, the same the same pipes, but... Uh... <laughs> no one does. <laughs> no one does. No one does. Tim Britton had a story about Beatty changing uh, some things about his swing during the offseason, so it's, it's something they're working on, trying to get that ball in the air more Honestly, often. It's yeah. a gamble worth taking. Brett Beatty's cheap in third base, as we've talked about. gets a little weird late. You could run into a ton of playing time. I think you get a good floor, but you also might get a lot of growth this season from Brett Beatty as well. Let's go to the Pakota numbers for the Mets. This is going to be disappointing to some, but probably about right to most. 83.1 wins is the number from Pakota. Third place in the NL East. Too hot, too cold, or just right? I'm going to go with just right because... If there is any sort of upward pressure on it, it won't be enough to make the wild card. I don't think there'll be a buyer, so I don't think they're going to add necessarily. They could sell. They could be an, a 500-ish team that's excited about some of their young players and still find a way to sell. And I do think that they do have some pieces. Harrison Bader is on a one-year contract. You know, like if if he's playing well and someone needs a, a center fielder late in the, in the season, that happens. You know, we just need a center fielder, and it's they're not going to be that many on the market. So. They could sell some pieces here or there. Some of their starting pitchers they could sell. So, you know, I think uh, I think it's just right. Yeah, I had them as a just right as well with the expectation that they're going to keep trying to play the middle. If they see something that they like that makes them better in the long run, they'll make a trade that makes them better in the long run midseason. If they see something that makes them a little bit better in the second half, then they'll do that because they have the, the flexibility with the payroll that they're able to run to kind of do whatever suits them. And I just think they're... They're okay. They're not great right now. That's where they're living. If they have pitching injuries, they could be in a world of pain. That could be the, that's true of most teams, but this is one where even with the couple of young guys that we like, that could be yeah. the thing that causes them to lose a ton of games. Or even if their veterans don't bounce back, like they, they bet on a few bounce back veterans, you know, like, yeah. Quintana's like projected for like a five ERA. So like if he just plays his projections, you're kind of like, oops. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see what uh, year one of the David Stearns era with the Mets actually brings. A uh, quick note as we go, theathletic.com slash rates and barrels gets you a subscription $2 a month for the first year. There's fresh rankings up. We got stuff rolling out in the draft kit each and every day. So be sure to check that out. Make sure you jump in the Discord if you haven't done so already. The link for that is in the show notes. Uh, you can find Eno on Twitter at Eno Saris. You can find me at Derek and Riper. Find the pod at Rates and Barrels. That is going to do it for this episode of Rates and Barrels. We are back with you on our YouTube channel at 1 o'clock Eastern on Friday. Probably the toughest podcast I've ever done. <laughs> Thanks for listening. <laughs>